Uh, Yoris is going to talk about uh, challenge models in animals. Uh, Peter's going to talk about safety and, and ethics and regulatory considerations. And then we get to hear Chris's reflections on the COVID pandemic uh, challenge model experience. So we're really looking forward to that. Uh, but before we begin, I have a confession to make. I previously have not been a big fan of challenge models. And I think it's because I started out, my first vaccine I worked on was the rotavirus vaccine. And at the time that I started working on it, the challenge models were quite variable. And of course, the attack rate of naturally occurring rotavirus is so high that you can do an efficacy study with a relatively small sample size. A couple hundred infants is all it took to get efficacy. But I will say that was a long time ago. I'm not going to tell you how long ago that was, but it was a long time ago. And I have since been converted uh, to really understand the value of the challenge model in vaccine development. And I wanted to share one personal experience that I think drives home Chris's message about how challenge models can indeed de-risk uh, vaccine development and really help save the costs of phase three trials. Uh, and um, that has to do with just a very recent example. Uh, we just got data a couple of months ago from an influenza challenge study. And it was really important data because it's not a vaccine, but it's a novel construct uh, that was an antiviral that's conjugated to a long-acting immunoglobulin. So very novel construct. Oh my gosh, is it going to work or not? And, and the reason we were developing it is to meet unmet need, uh, in influenza. Yes, there are many influenza vaccines, but the effectiveness of those vaccines in highly immunocompromised individuals or individuals with multiple comorbidities is significantly lower than it is in the general population. You know, some studies where we've been able to compare directly like where the effectiveness of the influenza vaccines might be 50 to 70% in the general population, we're talking 5 to 10% in these individuals. So we wanted to say, okay, we've got this novel construct that can prevent, we think can prevent influenza, uh, but uh, will it work? And, and how do we de-risk it before going into large phase three trials? Uh, so we did a proof of concept in healthy adults uh, and uh, we were looking at the ability of the construct uh, to prevent influenza. And in fact, the results were favorable. Um, it reduced PCR confirmed infection. It reduced the severity of symptoms. It reduced uh, the viral load over time. So based on those data, that gives us the confidence now to move forward into a phase 2B field efficacy trial to continue development of this very novel um, construct that, that can prevent influenza likely over a six-month period. So I just thought I would share that story to drive home some of the points that, that Chris was making in, in his um, wonderful talk about challenge models and just give you a real life example, another real life example. He gave many, but another real life example of why they can be so useful. But with that, uh, we want to dive right in and we also want to save time for questions. So yours, can I turn it over to you to talk about uh, animal models and challenge studies? Thank you, Penny. And um, with pleasure, of course, so uh, while the slides are loading up, I hope on the animal. Yeah, you uh, can just advance. Yeah. Should be there. So here we are. Before going into the different slides, a little bit history about um, animal models. So animal models are used since more than six decades already. So just after the Second War, when industrial production of uh, animal vaccines started, we needed a tool in order to know quickly, relatively quickly, if these vaccines were efficacious or not. So the advantage in animal health, of course, if you can call that an advantage, you can work quite severely till the end, you see what I mean, with the target animals. That being said, it's not allowed to do anything you like to do. This is uh, safeguarded by 
uh, ethical committee. It's already since the 70s when I started working uh, in virology and in, in, and in industry, also with this uh, famous man. So we, you always have to submit, like in human challenge trials, like in human trials, your protocol to ethical committees. This is the first thing. So we should not confuse and think that everything is possible. If the contrary, now with the policy of three R's, there is a general global policy to limit animal trials. So animal trials are still used where it's really useful. Secondly, very importantly, what we learned during these decades of uh, animal trials and challenges with many viruses is that you have to standardize your challenge virus. I will not go in detail. You have to um, uh, assure the quality, the purity, of course, and now the methodologies of gene analysis and uh, um, uh, new um, uh, NGS methodology allows to assure that the challenge virus is really the virus you like to use. There is no contamination. And another very important um, point is that a lot of uh, those escalation studies can be done on animals. So, and ultimately, the animals are, of course, uh, euthanized at the end of the trial because they cannot go neither in the consumption and uh, for uh, animal uh, welfare reasons. So, all these measures are taken. But very importantly, so the, 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 the amount of virus or bacteria you give in a challenge model can change a lot the outcome. So, and from there we know what infectious pressure means also in the environment. So if you give between, for example, in a flu, where I have quite a lot of experiments, experience in, in pigs 10 to the 8, you generate severe disease when you only give 10 to the 2, well, even half of the pigs will not be infected, etc., etc. So, um, to finalize, um, can we extrapolate results we have in animals? So, whether it's mice, guinea pigs, uh, llamas, or uh, uh, pigs, or bovine, etc., etc. I leave it with a question mark, and the Germans would say, "Jein." So, the first example is. MERS-CoV-2, uh, MERS-CoV-1, MERS-CoV-0. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> you see the intellectual contamination of uh, what happens uh, since three years. So MERS is, of course, as you all know, the cousin, a very close cousin of the SARS-CoV-2, and the first cousin was SARS-CoV-1. So uh, with MERS, um, we did that in a European project. We were happy to work a lot on MERS, uh, on MERS to understanding better the cause that would uh, follow. So here I show you an example on uh, alpacas. So uh, alpacas and llamas, these are the kind of animals and dromedaries who are very susceptible. So we know if we vaccinate dromedaries, camels, etc., etc., there is no transmission, transmission anymore to humans. So we are to completely in the One Health uh, uh, system. And, uh, no, sorry. Uh, I wanted to probably here. No. Okay. Anyway, um, um, so the first uh, A is the establishment of the challenge model. It worked. So and two is, is an example of animals that have been vaccinated. Um, with two administrations of the vaccine, and then the vaccinated animals are put into contact with challenged animals. So it's already the proof that uh, you protect from a virus that is excreted through the environment to the vaccinated animals. So, so this had been val validated before. You uh, challenge the animals and you bring them into contact with other non-challenged animals. And here we know, for example, that you can protect from environmental contamination. The second one is SARS-CoV-2, so the cousin, the recent cousin, where a lot of trials have been done into non-human primates. 
Uh, by the way, the hamster model is also a very interesting one. So I just show that here that, first of all, if there is a reasonable amount of immune reaction, here I only show the antibodies, and in B, uh, so in the, the, the in, in the down uh, figure, you see the um, reduction or prevention of fighter shedding. So this is what we can do, what we do very uh, often and very regularly with in vaccination challenge trials. Condition is always that you establish, validate your challenge. Now in flu, another very important point is the kind of virus you use. And uh, the flu is a, a very good example you, because we have hundreds of different of uh, viruses. We have a high variety, so we call it homologous challenge or heterologous challenge. And in pigs, uh, for example, here, uh, I show here the homologous when you use a vaccine, experimental vaccine, that is produced or uh, developed from the same strain as you will use for the infection, we prove that it is highly efficacious. Um, I will come back on SARS-CoV-2 um, between Wuhan and then all the rest. So when you start to deviate from the original one, well, the protection decreases. And then when you only use the control or uh, the adjuvant alone, well, there is no protection. That means this uh, animal excrete 10 to the 8 per milliliter uh, virus per nasal excretion. Um, so um, these models really show uh, how far you can go and how you can test an experimental vaccine. I must say in my experience at that time in the 80s, we were called from time to time um, by producers of um, flu vaccines for humans. We tested them in pigs. And I must say, when the results in pigs were good in general, we saw that also clinically in the field, the results were relatively good. Now, the discussion of correlates of protection, that's something in the animal health field we practice already since, since decades. So the animal models also serve, and we have the advantage that we always can work on the target animal. And one of the, of the uh, big advantages of being able to work on the target animal in animal health developing vaccines, there is no such thing as phase one, phase two, phase three, because safety and efficacy is directly tested under these controlled conditions. So for these different diseases, the correlates of top protection are very well established. So that means that if you have in theory, a new vaccine, you do not need anymore to uh, go through the vaccination challenge because the references are there. Um, what I want to stress also, and then from a One Health perspective, and I think it's good that from the animal health side and from the human health side, we start to look over the fence, what happens uh, in, the garden, in the garden of the, of the neighbor. So there are a couple of viruses now for example, the artery viride, which also can infect not only pigs, but also uh, poultry, uh, fish, and non-human primates. Parvoviruses come very close to non-human primates. So that means that the animal models, we should probably, in a pandemic preparedness, look where they can be useful in order to prepare for the virus classes that we know, more or less, which are the usable uh, suspects to generate a pandemic. So another um, coronavirus we, we know since a long time is uh, infectious bronchitis, from which we know we are not surprised, at least that, uh, in the veterinary field, that coronaviruses mutate. We should rather be surprised if they do not mutate. And then correlates of protection have been very well established for rabies, and foot and mouth disease. And now I come to my last slide. So, and this is an overview we made end of 2020, early 2021, and we published, we made an overview, a comparison of all the published results, well, the published results at that time 
of the first vaccines against um, SARS-CoV-2. So we made a comparison of the challenge results. And what we have seen there, that um, there was a high reduction in virus replication and virus excretion by those vaccines who were really efficacious. Um, we looked at um, eight different vaccines so, and, so, and those vaccines which did not make it to the market did not come well out from this uh, challenge results neither. Um, that being said, at that time, these were homologous challenges. That means the vaccines were produced from the Wuhan strain and it were Wuhan challenge strains or Wuhan-like, very close, that were used for challenge. So we all know today that with the Omicron and uh, IBX, so and so and so, that uh, it's not longer the case. Fortunately, we know in the meantime that there are other um, uh, immune mechanisms that protect from severe disease, but not from infection. So, and I end here to introduce my colleagues. So, uh, can we extrapolate from animal trials to humans? I would be very cautious. Don't, uh, so, um, if I uh, answer of German, I would say Jain, and then it depends from case to case. However, chin can be extremely, also in animals, I think it's, it would be good if we pay more attention to that because it can learn us a lot about the immune processes protection or not, and then uh, can probably even save time for really more uh, designate, more design the real chin trials. And then uh, there is a fantastic publication where Chris uh, collaborated a lot. So Killing Lee and others in Nature Medicine in 2022. So now to the human colleagues. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't have to introduce myself. We did that yesterday. Um, IABS has been busy with CHIM trials um, over a long period now. Um, and I have to make the same confession as Penny. When I heard the first time about GYM trials, then I was, an, I was a regulator, a uh, vaccine regulator. I was not enthusiastic at all. Um, they had to convince me. Um, but okay, over the time, I think I am much more positive than I was. In Strasbourg, I give you all the um, references. If you are interested in in this gym, we made a number of conferences, and these are conference reports. I can say they are pretty well written, and you can learn about it. Um, we did in Langen in 2019 uh, a discussion on what kind of uh, production process do you need for a gym strain? because I will come to that uh, in, an, in another slide a bit later, it is not that evident to produce um, these strains. Um, then a number of ethical issues, yeah? Is it ethical, just straightforward, to infect someone, yeah? Um, I understand immediately that somebody who has not been involved, like Christoph, um, that you have a certain, come on, um, prenum non, non se, first do not harm, yeah? What if for the treatment there is no, sorry, for the disease there is no treatment, yeah? Influenza, dengue, Zika, COVID-19, there is no clear treatment for that. Is it ethical to do this? Um, Yes, I think you, again, have to come as a regulator to the benefit-risk balance. What are the benefits of your gym trial and what are the risks? And then you will have to come out with um, an ethical design. 
what is the right challenge those yeah and then you come into the discussion of um is the chim trial um extrapolatable to real world um situation because in an influenza you will put uh, a number of virus 10 to the x in the nose but infectious mostly are done um via the um aerosol in the in 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 the air so how are you going to extrapolate and is if you cannot extrapolate is it ethical to do this chim trial do we know enough about the disease why not do a clinical trial on covid-19 um in march 2020 yeah because we didn't know anything about the disease you cannot um expose somebody to a disease you don't know anything about so the knowledge for influenza versus covid-19 is is completely different then i come to to the gmp uh question we had a discussion with polelli institute they said oh it is clear your challenge trial should be produced following gmp good manufacturing process but oh sorry what if your uh, strain has to be produced in snails how are you going to apply gmp i don't think that is possible yeah so there is an, an a document if you are interested um the um, the reference of the document was was shown on the previous slide um we did with the welcome trust and polelli and uh some other people people from cianciano worked on it as well to give guidance on how to produce the strains in a regulatory acceptable way and then what about children oh it's very easy i called the, the chairperson of um the pdco the pediatric committee at ima and i asked could, would you be willing to come to our conference and give a talk on it oh, no why because the answer is very simple no way but look that table is a table from the rtss clinical trial 16000 children yeah and more than 80 children died from malaria in that trial and that is an ethical clinical trial only 80 children died of the 16000 um if you do a challenge trial in 200 children not a single child will die from malaria because you will do pcr testing in advance and before they have even symptoms you will treat them so you will have to convince me that 200 deaths in an rts this field trial is ethical and a challenge trial in malaria in africa where children die is not you have to extrapolate that um in the public in the population you are doing the trial I don't think it is ethical to do a, a child trial for malaria in Belgium in Antwerp. I fully agree. But I can imagine that in Mombasa or in uh wherever in Africa it is ethical. But that is up to the African community and the African ethics committees to decide upon. That's not my cup of tea. And then here a, a number of 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 differences, yeah you can do a challenge trial with um oral polio vaccine because it's live attenuated you can do the same for the rota they are oral um live attenuated vaccine so you could work with them and that is quite easy because they are licensed vaccines um a very very good established model is malaria it's a treatable disease and the control model has been used in several instances uh cholera also a treatable disease controlled model was used for as uh, chris said for vaxfora um and for influenza already a lot of people have been tested um i will almost stop here there is a very nice um overview article uh from a colleague of somebody here in the room uh from Leiden Meta Rustenberg has published in 2018 all the different 
models at that time available. In the meantime, we are five years later. Uh, she should um, make an, an update of her article. Um, and then I'll stop here because this is COVID-19 and Chris is going to talk about Thanks, Peter. So I'm, I'm going to try and go quickly and just illustrate rather than going into any detail, just so that we have plenty of time to, to discuss. Um, so, so we were invited in the middle of 2020, around June 2020, by the UK Vaccine Task Force to think about human challenge with SARS-CoV-2 based on our experience with other respiratory viruses. And that was, as Peter was saying, really the, the sort of cusp of having enough field data to understand whether it was even going to be possible to do this whether there was going to be a, a population that was um, at low enough risk to, to make this development of a, a new challenge model in the middle of a pandemic worthwhile and feasible. And the, the, the initial um, rationale for, for doing this was that uh, a number of um, groups believed that there was a risk in the first generation of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines that some of them might fail, and indeed some of them did fail completely, remember, and others might might have some efficacy, but they may not reach the levels of efficacy that we really needed. And so if you had a, a, a set of first generation vaccines, which were um, about 50 percent efficacious, um, similar to the sort of flu vaccines, you're probably not going to be able to get on top of the, the pandemic in the way that we actually did. And so then what do you do? So you have a number of potential candidates. You don't necessarily know how to triage them in a rational way. And so the vaccine task force thought that human challenge could be a way to do that. Um, of course, in the end, we didn't need that, fortunately, but we still perceived during the process of, of thinking about this that there were important questions about the pathogenesis, the kinetics of the infection, which are not well established from, from field data, um, which would also in the short term allow us to assess diagnostics. Um, of course, we also know now that the vaccines that we have are suboptimal in a number of ways in terms of durability of protection, in terms of their ability to interrupt transmission, um, in terms of their cross-strain protection capacity. And so going forward, there may be a role for human challenge again in trying to triage the, the newer vaccines coming online, which may be employing completely new technologies and trying to stimulate arms of the immune system, which are not so easy to assess as serum neutralizing antibodies. So um, we were uh, helped greatly by the WHO, who convened two working groups early in 2020 to explore the ethics of um, an ethical framework for conducting SARS-CoV-2 human challenge during the, the pandemic. Um, the eight ethical principles are, are shown there. And then uh, a working group to also define the uh, the, the practicalities of that. And I think the things which really became highlighted were that we needed to clearly assess the need to do this. What could be gained and what could be gained from human challenge which could not be gained any other way? Because as we know, the disease was circulating widely in, in the community. So why not just do the studies in naturally infected patients? Um, there needed to be consensus between uh, the public the public uh, in the place that the human challenge studies were being done, um, government, academia, healthcare, and industry. So all the stakeholders in uh, the pandemic and vaccine development for the pandemic. Um, obviously, careful participant selection was the, was the key risk mitigation um, factor. Uh, healthy 18 to 30 year olds were entered in this study because we knew very robustly from field data that these were uh, low risk individuals. Um, and then we implemented a number of additional um, protection measures with the high quality challenge agent manufacturer, conducting these studies within a hospital where we had access to higher level clinical care, as well as all the close monitoring and the rescue treatment. As it came online, um, we uh, incorporated all those rescue treatments and now have Paxlovid as, as, um, as a standard. So this is um, the, the initial clinical um, readout data. So first of all, to say that we had huge amounts of public support. So we had almost 27,000 people register their interest to enter the study. And we whittled those down to only 34 seronegative individuals whom we challenged. 
And and we were really surprised that with only the lowest dose that we attempted, which is 10 TCID50, which is about 50 infectious particles, we were able to infect over 50% of the individuals. And we decided at that point, for safety reasons, not to dose escalate, although we could have done in retrospect. Um, we On the right, you can see the viral load data in the top two panels. And, uh, and um, you can see how, how much data we accumulated over the course of the infection. So twice a day, we were measuring people's viral load. And these data, apart from immediately giving us that information, is, has also been incredibly useful in mathematical modeling, giving us um, extremely accurate estimates of when the virus first appears, when it disappears, and which we've been able to correlate with immune responses. In the bottom are the symptom data. In red is the total symptoms, and in and right the change in people's uh, smell test scores. So people did develop symptoms. There are clinical readouts for this model, but uh, they were all uniformly mild. Um, in addition to viral load from swabs, we have also been able to measure viral load in the environment as an additional readout measure. And I think that's important because as we go forward into thinking about transmission reduction or transmission blockade, we are aware that viral load in the nose does not perfectly correlate with, uh, with contagiousness. Although, in fact, in our studies where we uh, sampled air, the breath that was coming out of individuals and multiple surfaces in their rooms, um, there was not much uh, correlation between symptoms and, and the amount of virus in the environment, but the closest correlation was between the nasal swabs and the environmental uh, virus um, detection. So the other uh, unique thing that we were able to do in this study is that we could uh, st investigate people who were definitively exposed but resisted infection and did not develop sustained infection. And in fact, this group is made up of two distinct groups. There are people who had no virus detection at all throughout the course of the experiment, but then there were others who had these very uh, low-level isolated virus detections, which we are calling um, transient infection. And using the most cutting edge um, molecular techniques, we've been able to start to look to understand what distinguishes people with sustained infection, transient infection, and those with no viral detection. And this is using single cell RNA sequencing of swabs from the nose. Um, and what you can see is that the people with sustained infection had an influx of immune cells, which peaked around day 10, but not much going on in the day one to three time point. But uh, to our surprise, the people with trans infection had a very robust um, uh, influx of immune cells uh, really immediately after the virus exposure. And you can see that um, in the sustained infection, those immune cells are um, uh, a wide variety of innate and adaptive immune cells, um, similarly with trans infection, but really only at that day one time point. And then even in that group who had no viral detection, there was the movement of cells into the upper respiratory tract. And those were, interestingly, primarily resident memory T cells, which I mentioned before. So this gives us some clues about how to perhaps select or develop better vaccines, which may have a greater impact on, on uh, viral transmission. Uh, so going into the future, I just wanted to um, highlight what we're thinking about in terms of the model and how, it's, how it may be used. So we um, are now uh, running a study with the Delta Challenge agent, which we have made, and, and we're starting to do the dose escalation. And we're in the process of manufacturing an Omicron BA5 Challenge agent. And at that point, um, with the models optimized, we should have two quite antigenically divergent viruses which hopefully we anticipate will cause breakthrough infection in people with pre-existing immunity. And this will allow us to test non-conventional vaccines, better assess transmission reduction or blockade even, and in the future, cross-protective uh, capacity of universal vaccines. Okay. Thank you, Chris. And a round of applause for our panel. Okay, so now we are ready for your questions. You have the world's experts right here. So what do you want to know about challenge models? Blue sweater. Hi, Alelisa from South Africa. I just want to, to, to ask if, how do you deal with death events in this kind of trials? And do you provide any kind of support for participants who end up developing severe disease? Thanks. 
if I understood the question well, how do you take care of adverse events in a clinical team? Yes. yes? How do you provide support for people who end up, you know, developing severe disease? Well, I think I'm going to deviate that question to my neighbor. <laughs> yeah, so I think this was a, a really important thing to think about in, in the context of SARS-CoV-2, where we had incomplete information, not only about severe disease, which we were actually quite confident was not going to happen in, in the model, but long COVID, which at that point we didn't have full you know, long-term data about. Um, so, you know, the first thing is that uh, informed consent is incredibly important. Um, so obviously there are some things which are known risks and there is a certain amount of unknown risk and, and that needs to be expressed to participants and they need to fully understand that that risk is unknown and that their volunteering needs to take that into account. Having said that, we are obviously responsible for any um, long-term problems that they develop as a result of the challenge. And so we had access to um, specialists who were part of the study who would follow up any participants. Um, the the um, smell reduction uh, in most people resolved almost straight away within a few days, but in some people lasted for several months. And so they had to be seen recurrently by, um, by really the leading uh, anosmia experts that we could um, we could access. So, um, and, and then if something really long-term and serious does occur, um, they have access to insurance from the university, from, in our case, the National Health Service, um, and we would make sure that they had the best possible medical treatment for those complications. Okay, next question. Red Scar. <laughs> Um, when I hear about human challenge studies, I often hear, uh, who are these people? So I, I uh, wonder if you have done any evaluation on the demographics, uh, any minorities overrepresented, uh, socioeconomic status, and are these paid volunteers or these are like volunteers with no uh, pay? And then one question for the regulatory uh, agencies. Um, is diversity a requirement for these trials? You want to start, Chris, yes. and then I'll start. So, um, so we have done some work, and, and others have done quite a lot more work than us about trying to, you know, understand the types of volunteers who who enter these studies. Um, in general, they are tend to be younger, um, so often students. You, particularly where there's quarantine involved, there's a, an automatic bias because people who are working, who have other commitments, they often can't stay in quarantine for 10 days or 14 days. Um, so it does bias towards younger adults, um, students very frequently. People are paid for their participation in these studies. Um, and this is a, a, an area of ethical debate. Um, but in general, it's believed that it's fair to pay people for the, t the time that they spend um, coming to follow-up appointments, staying in quarantine, and in general, the amount that they're paid is not more than the minimum wage of, of the country of, uh, that the study is being done in. Uh, in terms of diversity, clearly there is a limitation in uh, the diversity of participants. So in our studies, the majority of them are white British. Um, we live in London, so we actually get a, a reasonable proportion of non-white um, non-British uh, volunteers, but even so, that's only still probably 5 to 10 percent maximum of in each study. So it, it doesn't really fully encompass the, the diversity of, of backgrounds that are needed. To um, add, add a few things from a regulatory viewpoint, this is not regulated that you need to have X, Y, Z in, in a clinical trial. But from a scientific viewpoint, the more the homogeneous your group is, the easier to interpret the data. So probably we will keep, they will keep, because they write a protocol, um, it as homogeneous as possible. Yeah. Um, another addition is um, Pierre van Damme did um, the polio uh, trial and they had to find 30 people to get eight, 28 days in quarantine. And it were not only students, yeah? There were a lot of people that took 
four weeks oh four weeks that i can do nothing and stay very easy so um it will depend on 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 the kind of study you are doing that you can find quite a a nice um part of of the population okay let's take a question from this side uh Beige sweater with the headband. Uh, thank you. Um, have challenge studies been thought about in terms of studying duration of protection, especially in cases where a disease might, you know, occur sporadically uh, or irregularly within a community, like a like cholera, for example, where you re-challenge the same challenge participants two years later or something of that nature? And is there any interest in using it in that context? Yeah, so some of that work has been done in the respiratory virus field, um, so in RSV in particular, but, but my very definite assertion that you were reinfectable with RSV every two or three years is based on experimental data. So um, uh, Caroline Hall back in the 90s um, challenged the same individuals every two to three months, and a proportion of them at every round got reinfected. So so some of that work is done, it's, it's really difficult to do because you need to keep those individuals in the study for a long period of time, repeated challenges are not straightforward. So it's not, not straightforward. There we have a lot of experience in the animal health side. So if you see the vaccination for your dog or cat, you, you have to uh, to boost within one year, two years. Well, it's because the challenge has been done one year, two years, for rabies, even three years. And it's also been done in malaria, although not for, you know, not for two years, but like at six month intervals, really looking at uh, the duration of protection as well. Okay, one more from this side on the end there in the black jacket. Uh, I was just curious how difficult it was to get ethical board clearance approval for you now human challenge models. And, um, you know, you would need a certain level of maturity of an ethics board to, to review that, uh, you know, model. Well, UK made a very nice solution to that. They have an ethics committee for CHIM trials. In Belgium and in most other uh, countries, uh, it will be much more difficult because you will need to have an ethics board. And in Belgium, it is the Ministry of Public Health who will appoint a ethical committee from Belgium. So it might be not even an academic center that not has have one um, CHIM trial before. So that's the reason why IABS is working hard to, to give a lot of information to the ethics committees. And we have uh, end of this month an ethics committee meeting with the ethics committees from Germany. Um, UK will be present, France will be present, the Netherlands will be present, to spread the information so that people can learn about it. As you are rightly stating, um, in the first ones, it was one hospital in Belgium, but and that was the ethics committee of that. But this ethics committee is not allowed to give in Antwerp, yeah, because it is appointed to... Um, avoid bias in the ethics committee versus the investigator. And thus now we have to educate the ethical committees on CHIM. Great. Okay, we probably have time for a couple more. I have Blue Spinner right here. Hi, Cristiano from Italy. Um, it has been mentioned that uh, there is a problem with the regulatory acceptance uh, homogeneity, uh, right? So there, there are different positions by different uh, regulatory authorities with respect to that. For you, what would be the benefit for uh, a guidance that is international uh, across different regulatory authorities? And what are the blo blockers for establishment of some general guidance on these very important uh, studies? You know, think about the GMP expectations uh, that, that you mentioned, Peter, or, or... We have been discussing a lot with, in scientific advice, with um, a number of authorities, whether CHIM would be acceptable for them. Um, and then mostly they come, yes, do you have rescue medication? That is one of the, the blocking elements. Um, there are a number of other um, elements in, in how good the knowledge at the agency about this. And 
what are you going to do with this data? Yeah? One of the discussion points that we will have in the Mombasa meeting um, after ADVAC, I will travel to Africa where we have such a meeting, where we will, where we will have a full regulatory set with Africans and um, America and EU. Um, one of the two topics is how acceptable are CHIM trials in your country and what kind of data, what are you going to do with the data? As uh, Chris said, uh, Vaxhora is the only uh, example that for a vaccine that has been licensed based on CHIM trial. But is this uh, possible extrapolatable to more of this? Yeah. And um, we have discussed with Norman and, and with a few others, what how are we going to do with this data? And for me, the ethical component is proof of concept. Yes, but is it ethical if it is really... Uh, something very dangerous to do only proof of concept. And if the outcome is good, why not go for licensure? Norman? Uh, hi, uh, Norman Baylor, former FDA. <laughs> uh, from the, uh, in the U.S., uh, I mean, the U.S. FDA has been involved in, the, in, in these discussions, and uh, CHIM trials for influenza have been done for many, many years in the United States. Uh, but in the United States, the regulatory authority is really involved in this. Uh, there's a requirement that the strain must be de developed under GMP, and it must be done under an investigation of new drug. So the, the requirements are rather stringent in the U.S. as it is as it stands now. But there's no um, there's no regulation that will prevent will will uh, prevent a CHIMP study, but it's just the bar is high in the U.S. And uh, I just wanted to make that point, that this is something that a mature regulatory authority like the U.S. FDA has allowed this, uh, but it had because of some, you know, historical uh, incidents, this has to be done under, under IND as far as the development of these strains. Thank you, Norman, for that. Um, Mike? Thank you. <clears throat> Great uh, panel. I wonder if I might uh, take the liberty of answering a question about the challenge at three years with cholera. That actually was done. It wasn't done with the vaccine, but it took back volunteers three years later who had participated in an initial challenge and then looked at uh, uh, how long, whether three years later, they were still uh, protected. And the answer was yes. Not only was it yes, but um, you couldn't grow vibrios from uh, the, the volunteers. And they were challenged with a very, very hot strain. The challenge rechallenge, where you use wild type to do the immunizing, uh, was actually the way to developing the live cholera vaccine. It then was how do we weaken the wild strain so that it, like a a Sabin oral polio strain still will give protect, protection without causing disease. The other thing, if I may, is to say that uh, for the FDA and other regulatory agencies, it wasn't just those challenge studies that led to the licensure of uh, CBD-103-HDR, of Xcora. And I think it's important to dispel that because it's constantly said that's one piece, but they're actually <laughs> that strain was licensed by a number of regulatory agents, other regulatory agencies, by not only uh, earlier vex uh, challenge studies, but by a uh, Reactive vaccination that WHO carried out in an isolated island, Panape in Micronesia, where there happened to have been a, uh, a census just before uh, this this outbreak, which was quite quite large in re in relation to the population. There was one hospital with great records. There was uh, uh, good records of who got vaccinated. And in that situation, there was a post, there was a, a real world, if you will, uh, assessment by the WHO group of 79% vaccine effectiveness. 
There was also a field trial, a large scale field trial that was carried out in uh, a very hyper endemic area of Jakarta where the vaccine did not show efficacy in that population. And for a long time, we couldn't understand that because in all other situations, it was very uh, immunogenic and, and was uh, effective. And what you heard earlier with, with John Clement's explanation of having uh, lots of coverage and how <laughs> if you have a, a highly efficacious vaccine, with high coverage, um, the efficacy actually goes goes way down. We think that's the explanation. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mike, for sharing that. That's so great. I would love to continue this. We could have a whole two day workshop on this, but un unfortunately, uh, we we don't have the time. Of course, uh, Joris, Peter, and I will be here through Saturday or beyond. I know Chris has to go, so let's please continue the discussion. Uh, and thank you again, panelists. Thank you all for your engagement. We really appreciate it.